ang ating babasahin sa banal na aklat ay matatagpuan sa Mateo 6:1 hanggang 4. Pag-ingatan ninyong hindi pakitang tao lamang ang paggawa ninyo ng mabuti. Kapag ganyan ang ginawa ninyo, wala kayong matatamong gantimpala buhat sa inyong ama na nasa langit. Kaya nga, kapag naglilimos ka, huwag mo nang ipag-ingay sa gaya ng ginagawa ng mga mapagkunwari. Naglilimo sila sa mga sinagoga at sa mga lansangan upang sila'y mapuri ng mga tao. Tandaan ninyo, tinanggap na nila ang kanilang gantimpala. Sa halip, kapag paglilimos, naglilimos ka, huwag mo nang ipaalam ito sa pinakamatalik mong kaibigan. Gawin mong lihim ang iyong paglilimos at ang iyong ama na nakakakita ng kabutihang ginagawa mo ng lihim ang siyang magbibigay ng gantimpala sa iyo. Pagpalainawa ang salita ng Diyos sa ating mga puso. Thank you, Uncle Ray, for reading that. If you didn't know what language he was speaking, he was speaking Tagalog. And I know I look Filipino, but I understood maybe like two words or three words. But thank you, Uncle Ray, for reading that. What we try to do every week is have, read scripture, have a scripture reading. And we had that in Tagalog. Uh, I'm so glad to see everyone here. Welcome, if you're a guest, welcome to those of you watching online. Uh, those of you who are part of this church family, uh, you may have noticed me and my family have been gone for the last three weekends. And we truly missed you all. We were in California for that for three weekends ago. And we were also in Korea for a week and a half. And it was a great experience. I was there for weddings. So I was there two, three weekends ago. I was officiating a wedding. Two weekends ago, I was officiating at my brother-in-law's wedding in Korea. He married a Korean girl. And it was a fascinating experience. I'll share a little bit more at the end of today's teaching about a story of some of the touring that, that me and my family did there in Korea. But it's just good to be here. I went uh, to... California and Korea for two weddings, and there's another wedding happening this weekend. We have Joel and Taylor. Uh, let's give them a round of applause. All right. So we're applauding ahead of time, right? Assuming that you both are going to say yes tomorrow. All right. And we also have, can we see, uh, we have family and friends visiting uh, for the wedding. Can we still raise the hands of those of you who are here? There's a large family here. Friends, we are welcome. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us today. Uh, if, you have already, if you haven't already received an invitation, join us for potluck. If you don't have any plans, uh, you're welcome to join us for potluck. So this, this month, I've experienced, I'm going to be experiencing three weekend, three weddings in, 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 uh, in the month of October. I'm excited about that. We are starting a new sermon series this week. Uh, the last three weeks, uh, Pastor Rodney had a series on making room for God. How many of you who were here were blessed by that series? I know I was blessed and I was challenged by, by that series, and he did a great job with that series. We are beginning a new series entitled, Gaining to Give Generosity as a Way of Life. Gaining to Give Generosity as a Way of Life. What we're trying to do in this series is to learn how to become generous or how to become generous people in today's world, in today's society. I'm really thankful uh, for Uncle Ray's story, his mission story of what happened in the Philippines. What he, what he shared and what he is embodying and modeling for us is a life of generosity. And what I've realized, the reason we're, doing, we're in this series is we're trying to learn what it means to be generous and how to be generous. What I realize more and more in today's society is that people want to have a generous and unselfish legacy. I've read this in several books. I've heard this repeated in several circles, both religious and non-religious, but maybe you've heard this story before. Imagine your, your funeral, and imagine who are the people at your funeral, sitting in the front, 
uh, the family that's sitting right in the front, the family and friends who are there. And then in the literature that I've read, and you've heard this before, maybe you've heard this before, what do you want people to say at your funeral? Most people, many people, no one will ever say, no one will ever say, I wish I worked more, right? No, a lot of people will say, I wish I would have spent more time with my family and my friends, okay? So no one's going to say, I wish I, wish I would have worked more. Uh, no, one, no one will also say, uh, I wish that I want people to tell, to share that uh, I was a selfish person. No one wants to say, no one wants a legacy of selfishness. And you know what's interesting, both in the religious and the non-religious world? I'm realizing that it appears that our culture, although it wants to, we want to say, hey, we want to be generous people, we want a legacy of generosity, that at the end of my life, I can look back and say, I've spent my life not only for myself, but for others. This desire and this desire in our modern culture, we just don't do a good job, especially here in America, of fostering a lifestyle and a belief and a, and, and, and a, a culture of generosity. So recently, I was at a non-religious leadership event, okay, a non-religious leadership event, and the topic of money came up. And I found it really interesting because, you know, they, they were, they were right, trying to raise funds for uh, building a well in Kenya, right? So, hey, let's give so we can build a well. But I, I found this line, and I was there with a friend, and I wrote this down. And there was one individual, you know, talking about generosity and wealth. And when they were introducing this individual, this person said, this person, he has served his way to the top. He has served his way to the top. And what that sounded like to me was, you serve your way to the top. So the reason why you give is so that you can gain. And that's what I heard in this non-religious space. And it was funny to me to hear that because the marketplace says, we give in order to gain. We serve in order to put more money in our pockets, right? Now, this just doesn't sound right, does it? It doesn't sound right. We serve to put money in our pockets. It doesn't sound right. It appears that our culture today is driven by profit and driven by gain. But here's the problem. There's nothing wrong with making money and earning a living, but if we live to primarily fill our pockets, what will happen is we will ignore people who have empty pockets. There was one writer by the name of Kerry Newhoff who said this, he was talking about money and mission. Money is not the mission. Money funds the mission. Okay, I like that line. Money is not the mission. Money funds the mission. So the essence of life is not money and gain. And I remember hearing one speaker who was sharing about a pastor who asked this question that really struck a chord in his heart. He was a, a businessman who who was really wealthy, and he went to this, uh, this conference, this church conference where they're talking about business and ministry, and the pastor asked this question, which is a really striking question. He asked, do you have money or does money have you? Do you have money or does money have you? Do we give in order to gain or do we have enough and do, have we already gained in order to give? That's what we're trying to learn. How can we reverse that so that we're not just giving so that we can gain, but how can we come from a position of, I have everything I need in order to give? And it appears that religious and non-religious people both have a desire to be generous or at least appear generous. So how can we truly be generous? How can we truly be generous people where we're not living to give in order to gain, but rather reverse that trend where we can come from a position where we have gained everything that we need in order to give? How can we truly be generous? Today's teaching, as we begin this series, will inspire us to become genuinely generous people. The title for today's teaching, 
It's coming from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. The title is Genesis, uh, Generosity Beyond Recognition. Generosity Beyond Recognition. And we're going to answer three questions. One, what is self-seeking generosity and why is it unhealthy? Question two, what is selfless generosity and why is it healthier? And three, how do I become selflessly generous? That's what we're going to aim to do in today's teaching. Let's pray before we start. Father, we're beginning this series on generosity, and we want to be truly be authentically generous. Uh, I've done a recent audit in my life, and you've spoken to me through this teaching and challenged me to be more generous. And I pray that as we open Scripture, which was already read in Tagalog, and we read it today in English, I pray that you will speak to us and teach us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. I'm in the New International Version. You're welcome to turn there uh, in your Bibles. If you don't have one, there should be a Bible in the pew in front of you. If you don't have that, open up your smartphone or open up your tablet. It's even in the bulletin. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And we're just going to be in four verses trying to figure out how can we become selflessly generous. Look at verse 1, Genesis chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. I'm in the New International Version. Jesus, if it's written in red, who's speaking? Jesus is speaking, verse, verse, verse 1. He says, he's, he's, this is the Sermon on the Mount, right? One of the most popular passages of Scripture. And Jesus just proclaimed the good news of the gospel. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, the first time that you see the word good news or gospel in the gospels in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John appears in Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. Jesus is beginning his ministry, and the text says Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel. And right after he begins to proclaim the gospel, he then says, this is what it looks like to be a gospel believer, okay? So we're trying to understand what does it mean to be a gospel believer? And Jesus says, if you're a believer in Christ and you are a gospel believer, this is what your life will look like in regard to how you give to the needy. He says in Matthew 6, beginning with verse 1, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. What does that mean? Jesus is saying, hey, yo, listen up. Don't make a performance out of your good deeds so that others will admire you. If you do so, you are not going to get God's applause. That's what Jesus is saying. Don't do good deeds and trumpet it from, the, from, the, from your roof. Stay quiet. Verse Verse 2, notice what he says. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Notice what he says there in verse 2, right in the beginning. So when you give to the needy, you see, giving to the poor in the time of Jesus was an important part of Jewish life. There was one commentator who, uh, by the name of, uh, last name France, Dr. France. He wrote this. By the first century, about 2,000 years ago, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem, there was a well-organized system of poor relief based in the synagogues, providing something of what our modern state-sponsored welfare systems aim to offer. For them, they would, for them, they would uh, assist the poor through the synagogue. But in today's culture, you know, we, we assist the poor through, through government, through, through welfare aid. But through them, during, during this time, at the time of Jesus, it was done through the, the church state, through the Jewish, the Jewish uh, system and the Jewish, the Jewish world. The funding of the system depended on contributions from members of the community. Some of them laid down under the regulations for the tithe for the poor. So you can imagine members would then give extra funds to help those who were in need. Giving to the poor, which was also called almsgiving. Have you heard of almsgiving before? Almsgiving was a cultural practice and expectation in Jewish life. 
Now, here is the problem with some people who would give to the poor. The text says in verse 2, so when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. Now, who were these hypocrites that Jesus was talking about? Jesus, if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was primarily rebuking the religious leaders. These were the pastors of the day. The religious leaders, we'll call them Pharisees, many of them Pharisees, they would trumpet their good deeds at the synagogue and on street corners. They would take their money and they would put it in the, uh, the offering plate or the offering box and they would make sure that they would flash their money and they would make sure they would, they would drop it and everyone would know, hey, I just, I, just, uh, I just donated for the cause of the poor. And they would tell everyone about it. Jesus had beef with these hypocrites, with these Pharisees. He was allergic to these hypocrites. The word hypocrite, what does that mean? Do you know what the word hypocrite means? The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word hypocrites, which means an actor. That's what the word means. The word hypocrite, hypocrite means an actor. What is an actor? An actor is a pretender. Actors act and are not tr their true selves on stage. You know, I think of, uh, who's a popular actor today? Uh, Ryan Gosling. Okay, he's a pro popular actor today. Nothing wrong with him, right? But many actors and actresses, they act a performance of a perceived reality, right? But it's not true reality. Now, I know nothing about Ryan Gosling or any of, uh, you know, and I don't know what the private like, life is like of actors and actresses today. But we know is that, what we do know is that they put on a great performance and display. Hypocrites and actors live for the limelight. They trumpet their good deeds everywhere. They write checks or they... They give money, and they want everyone to know. Religious actors, they love the limelight. They love trumpeting their good deeds because it feeds their ego. Religious actors, they flash their intelligence, and they talk a big game because they want to be big. Self-serving generosity is when I do good, good deeds in order to be loved. See, there's a difference between self-serving generosity and selfless generosity. Self-serving generosity is when I do good deeds in order to be loved and admired. Now, why is self-seeking generosity unhealthy? Why is self-seeking generosity unhealthy? Well, let me explain it this way. So, uh, was it, when was it? Up? Last month, I think it was the month of August or July, I decided to write you know, a Facebook post, uh, I write an article or just, just a small article in a Facebook post to see how much, uh, see how much influence I would have, how many, how many people, how, how much buzz did it, did it create, right? So I would write these posts. And friends, I really believe that there's a fine line between boosting my ego and feeding my ego, okay? There's a fine line between boosting my ego and feeding my ego. Now, here's the difference. So I would write these articles and I would post it once a week. And I don't think there's anything wrong. I mean, anyone here have a social media account, whether it's like Facebook, uh, Instagram, MySpace, anyone MySpace? <laughs> like, hey, no, no MySpace people here, okay? The, these social media companies, they spend billions of dollars and do market research to understand the psychology of people. Y'all, look, you on Facebook, and the first thing that, like, I open Facebook, right? And the first thing that I look is, do I have, oh, there's like one, I have three notifications. Three, there was a number three, right? I have a friendship request and some other posts from our, from our local church. Um, there's something about that, that like or the notifications that, that feeds us, right? Now, I would go on to see how much buzz I I, I would create through my articles, right? That would, that would, in a sense, would be like boosting my ego or, or checking likes in order to, to develop confidence to see if people are resonating with my writing, okay? So I don't think there's anything wrong with checking likes and boosting my ego so that I, I know I'm doing a good job and actually 
striking a chord with people, right, and the, in the internet space. But there's a difference between boosting my ego and feeding my ego, where the reason I go onto social media, onto these spaces, is not just to check likes, but to live for likes. Boosting my ego is checking likes in order to have confidence in my skill, but feeding my ego is to live for likes and to base my identity on what other people say about me. Let me give you a statistic from uh, Yale Medicine. Over the last decade, increasing evidence has identified the potential negative impact of social media on adolescents. According to a research study of American teens ages 12 to 15, those who use social media over three hours each day late, uh, were uh, faced twice the risk of having negative mental health outcomes, including depression and anxiety symptoms. The advisory states that other studies point to a higher relative concern of harm in adolescent girls and those already experiencing poor mental health as well as for particular health outcomes, such as cyberbullying-related depression, body image, and disordered eating behaviors, and poor sleep quality linked to social media use. Why am I sharing this? When my identity is primarily rooted in what other people think about me, when I'm only thinking about myself, I am prone to crash. Self-seeking generosity can be unhealthy because when I serve others to primarily boost my own ego, I risk emotional burnout. In other words, when I give, right, when I write things on Facebook, only to gain more likes, and I do that because my identity and my validation is based on what other people say about me, I am mostly thinking about myself and when I worry about my validation or what other people think about me and trying to find my identity by what other people say, I'm more prone to burn out. I'm more prone to do burnout. So we've learned that self-seeking generosity is when I do good deeds in order to be loved and admired. And we've learned that self-seeking generosity can be unhealthy because it can feed my ego and lead to emotional burnout. But friends, what is the opposite of self-seeking generosity. Well, the opposite is what we call selfless generosity. And this is what Jesus was talking about in verses 3 and 4. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 6, now in verse 3. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's basically, he's using a metaphor saying, just do it in secret, right? Verse 4. So that your giving may be done in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So what's Jesus saying here? The self-seeking generosity, like these hypocrites and these religious leaders do, no, nah, that's, that's not really, really going to satisfy. Here's, here's the, the true way of life, verses 3 and 4. When you give to someone in need, friends... Don't think about how it looks and do it quietly. God applauds not your loud acts of love, but your quiet acts of love. Not the loud, bombastic, hey, look at what I did. Look how much I gave to the church and how I, made, I, I gave to the cause and look what I'm doing. No, but the, the quiet and the humble acts of love. Self-serving generosity is when I do good deeds to be loved but selfless generosity is when I do good deeds to share love. There's a vast difference between the, no, the two. And how do we know when we are sharing love? Friends, I know, we know that we're sharing love when it hurts to give. That's how I know that I'm sharing love instead of sharing in order to be loved. I know that I'm sharing love when it hurts to give. And some of you all know, and you can think back in the days when you had your firstborn child. I know some here have had children recently. Look, you're not, having a child is the, one of the best examples of selfless generosity. There's really nothing in it for you other than waking up every three hours and changing diapers and feeding a baby, an infant. Some of you are all like, yeah, I remember that. 
been there, done that. That's been a long time ago, never again, right? <laughs> now I can, I can do that through, I can live, enjoy my, my grandchildren. I can live, ch enjoy children through my grandchildren. Self-serving generosity is when I do good, do good deeds in order to be loved, but selfless generosity is when I do good deeds in order to share love, and I know that I'm doing that when it hurts to love sometimes. Jesus shared an example in Mark chapter 12 of selfless giving, and I found it interesting as he contrasts the life of the religious hypocrites and those who didn't have much means. In Mark chapter 12, beginning at verse 38, Jesus contrasts uh, the religious self-seeking generous givers, self-seeking givers, and also the selfless givers. He says this in Mark 12, verse 41, Mark writes, Jesus sat down opposite the place, or in verse 38, as he taught, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law, right? The pastors of the day during his time. And God forbid that I would ever fall for this trap. Watch out for the teachers of the day. They like to walk around in flowing robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the most important seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at banquets. And then verse 40, look what he says about these religious leaders, these hypocrites. He calls, he calls them. They devour widows' houses and for a show make lengthy prayers. Everything's about a show. It's about acting. These men will be punished more severely. So on one side, he talks about the self-seeking givers. But notice the story about a selfless giver. He talks about a widow who didn't have much in her pockets. The text says in Mark 12, verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. So he's watching them, and he's watching the, 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 the rich, wealthy, religious people put their money in the offering, and then he noticed someone that surprised him. It says here, many rich people threw in large amounts, verse 42, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Notice what he says, verse 43. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. So the, the, the self-seeking givers thought they gave a lot and flaunted, Hey, look what I did. I gave a lot to the offering, in the offering plate. But, but Jesus is saying, the self-seeking seeking givers think they gave a lot, but the selfless giver, the poor widow, actually gave more. Why is that? Because, and here's the punchline, verse 44. The self-seeking givers, they all gave out of their wealth. But the selfless giver, but she, the widow, out of her poverty, she had nothing. She, she, you, pick her, you look at her pocket, she had nothing in her pockets. The selfless giver, she put in everything that she had, all she had to live on. Wow. The temple treasury that she was donating to was a designated area within the temple in Jerusalem where offerings and donations were collected and stored. And that treasury was used to collect funds for the maintenance of the temple and to support the priests and the Levites, the pastors of the day, of the day and to fund religious activities and sacrifices. The poor widow, the one who didn't have much in her pockets, the selfless giver, she gave everything that she had to the temple treasury because she loved the God of the temple and wanted to share that love with others. The poor widow, the selfless giver, is so moved by God that she thinks about God and others more than herself. She is not giving from her abundance. She's giving from her poverty. Why is that? Why was the widow who didn't have much in her pockets able to give so much? All that she had, you know why? Just like the series says, because she already gained everything that she needed in life. She might not have had a lot in her pockets, but she had a lot in her heart. Because you see, you might have a lot in your bank account, 
But the money that, the wealth that we have in our bank account does not satisfy the human heart. It doesn't. Is it an evil thing to have wealth? No. But that's not the reason we exist. Like Harry Newhoff said, uh, the money is not the mission. Money funds the mission. The woman who didn't have much, she gained everything that she was looking for because she had God. And it's because she had everything. She had the world in her heart. She had Jesus and God, God in her heart. She was able to give. She did not, she did not she was not self-seeking. She did not give in order to gain. Hey, look at what I'm doing. She was selfless in her giving. She gained everything that she needed, which was God, in order to give. You see, self, self-seeking generosity is when I do good in order to gain. But selfless generosity is when I do good deeds in order to share my gain. There's a vast difference. And religion, and I define religion. Uh, now, when you think of the word religion, you think of uh, church, uh, churches or religious denomina- church denominations. But I'm talking about religion like Christianity, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, even the religion of atheism. What religion teaches is I do something and my gods, or even my boss, will then accept me, okay? It's the way of religion. It's the way of the marketplace and the way of the world. I give in order to gain God. But Christianity is very different. The gospel is very different. The gospel says, I have gained everything that I need in God, therefore I give. And even in you know, we belong, uh, uh, our beautiful denomination is one of thousands of denominations in the world, okay? But is it possible that we have been duped by this definition of religion that, hey, I just have to sacrifice more and give more in order to gain God, in order to be accepted by people? If it is true that is the case, could it be, could it be that we have missed that I have missed the gospel? That the essence of life is not to give in order to gain salvation? No, that I have gained God and I have gained Christ by faith. I have salvation now and from the position of abundance and generosity, like I've received the generosity of God, then now I can give. Selfless generosity is healthier than self-seeking generosity because I serve others out of a genuine desire to love and support those who are in need. Last question, how do I become a selflessly generous person? I think there are at least two ways. Two ways to become, to become selflessly generous as we, close, as we wrap up this teaching. Number one, We practice generosity. Can you say the word practice with me? We practice. I'm I'm beginning a practice of taking sermons thanks to uh, feedback and thinking about my messaging. I'm asking, okay, it's it's easy for me to preach to preach and share teachings, but how are you doing living it out, Nestor? And so I was reflecting. How am I actually living out today's teaching? Selfless generosity. And I asked the question, all right, Nestor. All right, I'm journaling here. In what ways am I succeeding and struggling with this principle in my life? So I said, let's do an audit of my good deeds and almsgiving. So this is the conversation that I have with myself in my journal, on my computer. So then I asked the question, all right, Nestor, do I do good deeds and do I give to the poor? I wrote, yes, I do. I want to continue to practice goodness and giving and generosity. And then I said, I occasionally give funds to panhandler. You know what a panhandler is? Uh, those on the side of the streets asking for money, right? Um, I have children of four. Uh, what really catches you is when they put a Bible text there, right? John 3.16. And it just appeals to your heart, right? So I do that occasionally. But then I ask the question, all right, in what ways do I struggle with generosity? I put, ouch, tough question. Let's be real. First, doing an audit in my own life. Friends, I would encourage you, you want to go deeper with the Messiah and God, that you 
do an audit of your life. Take scripture and then apply it and ask, okay, how am I living this out? First, and I wrote, I think I could be more intentional about giving to the poor. I give for the advancement of the gospel, tithes and offerings. We'll learn more about that next week. But only a portion of the offerings we give in this local church is distributed to the poor. And we leave the almsgiving up to the local church. And so there is not a regular practice in my life of setting aside my resources to help the poor. So I put it down in intention. Set aside funds monthly, as I do with times and offerings, to give to those in need. And by God's grace, I'm asking God to help uh, bridge the gap between my intentions and, my act- and the how I actually live. And God will, God will work on my heart. Second, I need to be more intentional about spending more time with those in need. Most of my time is spent with my family and people in our local church. And when I'm spending time at the mall on most weeks, I go there on Wednesday nights uh, to meet people whom I connect with. I have this motivation of coaching and helping people come to know Jesus. But then I ask myself the question, how much of my time is spent with people who cannot offer anything to me? How much am I volunteering my time to serve? And I put in all caps, very little, ouch. And then I put down this intentional practice, habitually set aside my resources, my time, my talent, and treasure to help those who can't give anything back to me. And what if we were to do that? There was one speaker by the name of John Mark Comer, and I was listening to a talk he was giving about fasting and giving. And he shared something so amazing. You know, he was, he was sharing how, you know, they're living there in L.A. right now, and uh, they, they see a lot of wealth. And then he thought, man, what kind of impact is seeing wealth having on my children and on our teens and on our youth? And so he was sharing a practice, I think it was in his life or a friend's life, which was so cool. I, I just love this. He, he was, they, they, they intentionally developed uh, a weekly practice of generosity where they would go to a homeless shelter or they would go to a place with people who didn't have much and they would just serve every single week. That's such a beautiful thing. I think it's so cool that Uncle Ray is uh, 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 helping build churches in the Philippines. I think it's really cool that we have this shoebox ministry. I missed it last weekend because I was coming back from Korea. But it's so amazing. In order to give without expectation of gaining. So practice number so, so step number one to becoming more selflessly generous, practice generosity. And last but not least, we practice generosity, but primarily, we behold generosity. Let me share a story, a few texts, and then we're, we're done. I'm going to put a picture on the screen here. So I had the privilege of traveling to Korea this past week, or the past uh, two weeks. Uh, has anyone been to Korea before? Uh, have you toured in Korea? This is the first time I've always traveled there and stopped in Incheon at the airport. Awesome airport, by the way, and awesome. In one of the lounges, they have a buffet there. Awesome food, okay? Awesome food in Incheon. But I had a chance to be there for a week and a half. And last week, I had the privilege of, of visiting the, the, uh, the War Memorial Museum. Now, my history, my history of Korea and their war, I, I have a knowledge gap. But I found it fascinating to learn about the war in Korea 70 years ago between 19, the summer of 1950 and the summer of 1953. Going to the war museum was sobering. It was inspiring to see the sacrifice of all these soldiers there in Korea and also uh, from the United Nations, like the United States, Canada, and, and Britain and, other, and, uh, and, and the allies. But going there was, was, uh, was moving. And what happened when I was there, I was thinking, I was looking, I was, I was stopping as my, my, our wives, thankfully, they, they took the kids and they, they had a playground at, at the museum so they could play. And they let us husbands go in just to soak in the history. And there was one story of these, this, these two brothers that really, uh, really spoke to me. And you can't see the text here, 
because it's kind of small, but I just wanted to show a picture of these men. I took a picture of this. I'm going to read to you the story here. And what was written about this, these two men on the screen was this. Joseph Hirsi volunteered in the Korean War to take care of his younger brother, Archibald, who was already fighting in the war. You see, the North had come down in the summer of 2000, uh, 1950 and took Seoul, the capital, in three days. And it was at that point that President Eisenhower and the United Nations stepped in and, and, and intervened. And they sent all of these troops, from, mostly from America, which was really sobering to see placards for all of these United States soldiers that passed away and that died in the war, but also from other countries like Canada. And so one year into the war, on October 13, 1951, Joseph, who went to support his brother, Archibald, he died in the presence of his brother. Does that sound like self-seeking generosity or selfless generosity? Selfless generosity. After the war, Archibald went back to Canada. He always missed his brother who died to protect him. Selfless generosity. After 60 years, he rested peacefully next to his brother in Korea on April 25th. 2012. In order for us to become selflessly generous, yes, we must practice it, but we have to behold selfless generosity. When we read stories like this, both in non-religious settings and religious settings, there is a main story that we tell ourselves over and over and over again. Be faithful, give more, and then you will gain. Be faithful, be faithful, give more, and you, then you will gain. If we're only looking to ourselves and human beings for models for selfless generosity, I have, a, I have a word for you. Stories like Joseph and Archibald inspire us, but human beings pale in comparison to the one who, the one being who perfectly gave and generously gave to human, to, to human need. And who was that? Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verse 3 says, so when you give to the needy, who was the person who perfectly and generously, lavishly gave to the needy? It was Jesus. It was the one who gave everything to the needy. Jesus is the ultimate model of selfless generosity. Unlike the religious leaders, the, the Pharisees and the actors who were loud with their generosity, hey, look at me. Jesus wasn't loud. He was silent. He was quiet. Because the last verse that I'm going to read to you this morning, speaking about the suffering Messiah written almost six, seven hundred years before Jesus even came on this planet, speaking about Jesus, do you know what the text says? Isaiah the prophet wrote, Isaiah 53 verse 7. He, speaking about the Messiah, Jesus, was oppressed and afflicted, yet he, he did not open his mouth. He was quiet. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, as he was dying on the cross. So he did not open his mouth. He was quiet. Self-serving generosity is loud, but selfless generosity is quiet. And I believe that when we behold Jesus' selfless generosity every single day, I'm not just talking about coming to church and having a surface relationship with this God and getting your spiritual fix from a sermon. I'm talking about going deep with the Messiah and sitting and soaking in His selfless generosity for you every single day, opening Scripture and sitting not only to learn how you can continue to live, but live with generosity and taking that in every single day. This, the, and sitting at the feet of Jesus and seeing His quiet, selfless generosity. I think it's by beholding the one who was selfless that we become changed to become selfless 
generous givers. And friends, as our praise team comes up, when I gain Jesus, I gain everything. When I gain Christ, I have everything. And when I have everything, I don't give out of my poverty. I'm actually giving from abundance. And there's someone here today who has not, does, not have an, does not have a spirit of abundance. Jesus, the Messiah, is a stranger, and you don't really know him. He's not in your heart. And I want to encourage you, friend. That's you. There's a connect card on the screen. There's even a connect card in the pew in front of you. If you want to begin a relationship with this Christ or join a Bible study group, get baptized and, and be part of a, a thriving worship community, a small group even. Mark it on the connect card. And on your way out, drop off your connect card with our tithes and our offerings on the way out as our deacons collect our tithes and our offerings at the end of our service. It's with Jesus that I am abundant. I have everything that I need. Let's stand together and let's think about this Christ, this Jesus who gave all to us.